Shabbat Shalom. Parashat B'Shalach, this week's Torah portion, contains one of the most momentous and magnificent scenes in the entire Torah, the parting of the sea. As we uh, cross through the middle of the ocean, the waves are on each side. But more importantly than that image is the fact that this parasha, this Torah portion, generates one particular question over and over again to which I have a love-hate relationship, which is, Rabbi, did the parting of the sea really happen? Boy, do I love and hate this question. It's really dependent upon who is asking the question and in which manner they are asking the question. It has become a favorite question to, uh, to mock uh, Judaism. It has become a favorite question to, uh, to mock the, uh, the origin of our people as slaves moving into freedom through this passage of water. It is often asked with a, an ironic, ironic smirk with a uh, sarcastic tone to the voice. Did that really happen? And of course, the answer they're looking for is, ah, oh, you've got me. No, you're right. My life, my faith, it's all a lie. How could I have been so blind? If only you had asked me this when I was younger, I wouldn't have wasted my time. Obviously, that's not the answer I'm going to give. I wouldn't be much of a rabbi if that was the answer I was going to give. Unfortunately, the alternative answer, when the question has been asked in this manner, doesn't seem to satisfy them either. If I say, well, yes, actually, I do believe the parting of the... Uh, that's about as far as I can get before they go, ah, you're a fundamentalist, and storm off. You see, they're really not looking for an answer. They are looking for validation of what they already believe. And that is not a proper way to ask a question. A question should always be asked in good faith, even if it is for somebody who you believe will maybe passionately disagree with you, Ask the question legitimately. See what their answer is. It's OK if you still disagree afterwards. But asking it honestly and hearing an honest answer is very important. So when asked this question honestly, I love it. I love the question because it shows that somebody is beginning to actually ask questions deeply about the nature of miracles within Judaism. See, very often we have abdicated the concept of miracles to pop culture and to uh, the host societies that Judaism has lived among for a couple thousand years. And many people feel that whatever the usual definitions of miracles are, that must be Judaism's definition as well. When someone comes to me, honestly, legitimately asking, was, what was this miracle like? What really happened? Then I know they are ready to have a much deeper conversation. That is to say, move beyond merely reading the surface of the text to actually plumb its depths. So let's plumb the depths a little bit. What does the Torah tell us about the parting of the sea? Anybody have a uh, photographic memory that can remember those uh, details of the tale? Ah, uh, yes. It gets a little fuzzy if we don't have Cecil B. DeMille right in front of us. Yes. It didn't just happen. Exactly right. It is a, uh, a whole night's worth of uh, event with a wind blowing. And by morning time, there is a dry passage through which the Israelites go. And all day long, they continue to travel until the last one is out, at which point the uh, fire that had been holding back the Egyptians moves. And the Egyptians come in, and the waters close. All right, so what actually is happening? What did it look like? Well, we've got a couple different versions. We do have Miracle version one, uh, which is the Cecil B. DeMille version, or for those of you who are too young for the Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille version, maybe Prince of Egypt will uh, also work. Uh, if it's animated, you can even make it grander than what they could do with Cecil B. DeMille, although I do say I was one of those lucky who went on the uh, Universal Studios tour in Los Angeles, where you got to go through the parting of the sea. It was not as impressive as it was on the screen. But that is version one of the way the miracle might be conveyed. That indeed, there was a dry passage, and on either side were enormous walls of water stretching up far beyond us that we walked within the shadow, uh, that there were fish and whales and all sorts of other things going around, that this was a grade A special effects heavy miracle. But the Torah itself doesn't say 
exactly that. Uh, yes, the Torah does use the phrase walls on each side, but does it define wall? Does it explain exactly what a wall looks like? Does it even, do we even know what a wall might mean metaphorically, allegorically, or through the biblical usage of hyperbole? What is a wall but a means of defense, a means of protection? If a wall is this high but it protects you from the danger, I call that sufficient. Many of us here, living in uh, lovely sunny Florida, will know that during hurricane season, every now and then the water gets a little overwhelming, and yet a little wall of sandbags can sometimes be the difference between ruin to the home or being able to get by with just a, a little bit of water damage. A wall doesn't have to be high to provide the protection that is needed. Which brings us to version number two of how we might conceive of the miracle. Version number two is much more moderate. We are in a, uh, an estuary. We are in a, an area where there's a lot of water. The wind blows, and being of low tide-ish, uh, the wind is able to move the water to one side, revealing a small strip of land that we can walk across, but the pharaonic chariots are going to be stuck in. Anybody who's ever done any hiking in uh, central Florida will know that the ground can often be just stable enough for a person, but you wouldn't want to drive your car on it. Version number two. Version number three says, well, wait a minute, what if the wind blows? And in the blowing of the wind, you can just make out through the reeds. After all, this is Yam Suf, the sea of reeds, as it is described literally in the Torah. Perhaps it was just a dense, area of cattails or other types of papyrus, other reeds that were there. And when the wind blew, we could see where the wind broke, that there was indeed a footpath through it, because the growth of the, of the plants was a little different there. And so all we had to do was line ourselves up with the way the wind parted those reeds, walk along that trail, something that the Egyptians would have an impossible time traversing. Is there a difference between any of these three conceptions, apart from the visuals, apart from the picture? Ah, and that is what is revealing about the nature of miracles in Judaism. In Judaism, we don't have grade A miracles, grade B miracles, grade C miracles. We don't rank them based upon how impressive the miracle was in its visual effects or how improbable the miracle was within the, the boundaries of nature. A miracle is the right thing happening at the right time that leads to the right outcome. That's it. It can be entirely naturalistic. Indeed, according to our tradition and according to the outline in the text itself, God seems to prefer to work through the medium of the natural world. God made a wind blow. Why? Could God not have parted the waters without a wind? No, because it is God's way to reveal miracles through the natural world. God allowed us to walk across. Why didn't he teleport us? Why didn't he shorten the distance in some Star Trek warp technology way? Because again, God does not subvert the laws of nature. He simply guides us to those moments of inflection where ha having prepared ourselves, the outcome becomes favorable. Not exactly the normal conception of a miracle, at least not as far as the movies and pop culture tries to lend it. And yet, by using this conception of a miracle, we recognize, as we say in all of our prayers each and every day, that miracles are with us constantly. When we look for miracles only in that which is most grand and most impressive and most unnatural, then we think our life is very miracle poor. We think our life has been stripped of miracles. We think that there is nothing divine around us. But when we think of miracles in what some might consider a prosaic form, a naturalistic form, when we read miracles as we read the Torah, we recognize that, well, yes, that, that, that could be happening. That could happen. In fact, you know I've had a few times in my life where things have worked in improbable ways, not supernatural light shining down from a beam in the cloud and more angels singing, but nonetheless, the result was significant. The result was life-changing, life-saving. It was something that I needed at that moment in a way that I would not have been able to produce for myself. Judaism calls that a miracle. It doesn't have to be the miracle that will get you the title of a, of a play. 
It doesn't have to become something that will be visualized in art for years and years to come. What matters is that it is in our heart that what happened here was significant and led to the outcome that we call godly. The miracle of the Exodus was not the parting of the sea. It wasn't the plagues. The miracle of the Exodus was that God took a people that had been enslaved to freedom. That was the ultimate miracle. And how that looked on screen, how that actually played out physically, whether it be version one to version three, is immaterial. What matters is that when the credits finally rolled, a people that had been oppressed were now free and marching towards a new destiny. And those types of miracles are reproducible and they can abound around us if we're willing to ask the question in good faith, is this a miracle? Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>